Travel consideration provided by... Can we get real clear about life with psoriasis? Yeah, I'm ready. Is your treatment leaving you with uncontrolled symptoms? Like the cover-it-ups and brush-it-offs? Enough with good enoughs. Don't stay hiding or hurting. When your lotions and creams don't do enough to help treat the inflammation beneath the skin causing plaques and pain, it's time to get real about psoriasis so your dermatologist can help you get clear. Make the appointment and ask about Real Clear Skin. I am with Dolly Parton, y'all. Yes, and we're talking fashion, and we're going to tell you about my new book. So good. And Thank you. Happy. I don't get jealous of Rachel very often, but when she's with Dolly Parton, boy, do I get jealous. I'm waiting uh, for you to sing Hard Candy Christmas oh, right now. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the interview because it's going to be good. Okay, before we go, the MAFS Mafia is going to be re happening now. A big gun buyback is on for next month in San Antonio, and the councilman who's heading it up is looking for donations to help pay for it. How much anonymity, though, will gun owners expect? Dia de los Muertos Festival returns to San Antonio. We'll tell you why organizers are excited about more people attending this year and how people are keeping their loved one's memory alive. Still some more dampness. I'll talk about when the sky clears, when our next cold front arrives, and what it means for our weekend weather. The News at 5 starts right now. San Antonio's first ever gun buyback is happening next month, spearheaded by San Antonio City Councilman John Courage. People who participate will get HEB gift cards worth up to $300 per gun, depending on the type of firearm they turn in. Well, now that it's announced, the councilman says he now needs donations to pay for the guns relinquished by the owners. Garrett Berger with why previous promises that it would be a no questions asked sort of event can't be kept for now. But this November is the right time District 9 Councilman John Courage has wanted to do a gun buyback, or as he calls it, a voluntary weapons exchange for years. I'm very worried about the gun violence that is almost overwhelming in our community. Now he's using a hundred grand of his discretionary district funds and drumming up additional donors to pay for an exchange event on November 19th, when people will be able to turn in as many as 20 weapons at an Alamo Dome parking lot for the weapons to be destroyed. But we will not be asking them who they are, where they got the weapon from, uh, where they live. However, Police Chief William McManus says that won't extend to everyone. He's criticized gun buybacks in the past, though his department will be assisting at this event. McManus says police will immediately check serial numbers on site. And if there's a match for a stolen weapon or a destroyed serial number, they will have questions. Otherwise, he says, it's anonymous. That's the compromise we came to. Either we come to that compromise with SAPD involved or we don't come to that compromise with SAPD not involved. Courage says law-abiding gun owners shouldn't be concerned, though, and he's not expecting lots of stolen guns or guns used in crimes to turn up. If you're a bad guy, you're not going to turn in your gun. Instead, he frames it as a way to take unwanted guns out of circulation before they end up in hands that would use them for harm. This is not to say we expect to lower the crime rate by even 1%. But if we, through getting these weapons out of circulation, can save one life, then it's worth 10 times the investment that all of us are putting into this. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. A man trying to walk through three lanes of Highway 1604 early this morning did not make it across. He was hit by a tow truck, and the driver says he just couldn't stop in time. It happened near 1604 near Nacogdoches Road around 4.30 in the morning. According to SAPD, the tow truck driver was hauling a car away in the area when he says he noticed the man in the road. Police say the driver tried to stop, but it was too late. He hit him. The man died at the scene. Officers say the driver did stop and is not facing any charges. The Nacogdoches Road exit, though, was closed for about an hour as emergency crews worked. The name of the man who was killed has not been released. Maybe a little early for a Christmas reference, but a man learned the hard way he isn't Santa Claus after he got stuck inside a chimney last night. Police say he was trying to get away from officers. SAPD says 33-year-old Ethan Thomas became wedged inside the chimney of that house you saw there on Boulder Pass, not far from Judson and Stahl Roads.
They believe Thomas broke into the house four hours earlier. They tell us no one was home, but security cameras captured someone inside the home and police were alerted. SAPD says Thomas saw officers went back to the house and tried to hide in the chimney. Officers at the scene say they happened to peek inside a hole in the wall and noticed Thomas stuck in there. After firefighters freed him, police took him to jail. Here we go. The largest Dia de los Muertos festival in Texas returning to Hemisphere Park in less than a month. Every year, thousands of people gather to celebrate and honor their loved ones who have passed away. And this year, more space for more ofrendas will be available to families in Civic Park. Camilia Juarez with one family who explains why this tradition keeps the family's roots close. You know, I, I just feel like uh, for my daughters, it just further emphasizes the constant message that we send to them is don't forget where you came from, you know, and, and that starts from all the way down to Abuelita. Diana Garcia makes an ofrenda or altar for her mother every year. She says it started as an artistic therapy and now she feels like making an altar brings her closer to her roots. Every year, you know, that we've participated since then, I, I, we reveal a piece of my mother and his grandmothers that, again, we rediscovered and we just have to share with people. The Garcia's family altar will sit alongside at least 80 altars at the Muertos Festival at Hemisphere Park. Saturday and Sunday, October 28th and 29th. There will be live performances, local art vendors, and ofrendas from people all over San Antonio. Each ofrenda tells the story of someone's life and their memory. It's just to uh, make sure that we don't forget them. Last year, 130,000 people attended Muertos Fest, and organizers say they're excited because they have a lot more space here at Civic Park. It reflects our growth and it reflects San Antonio's um, embracing of, of, this, of this celebration. Muertos Festival art director Jim Mendiola says people who cannot make an ofrenda will have an opportunity to share their loved one's story through a central community altar. Over the course of two days, it grows and grows. People bring flowers, other photos. So uh, that's the part that's kind of organic and natural. Camelia Juarez, Kisa 12 News. So, market calendars, Dia de los Muertos Fest is Saturday, October 28th and Sunday, October 29th. And if you can't make it to Hemisphere Park, you can watch all the action. We're going to have it right here on KSAT 12 airing November 1st at 8 p.m. And for everything related to this year's Dia de los Muertos Fest and celebrations in and around San Antonio, you can scan this QR code on your screen right now for dates, times and places. Happening around America, Louisiana Representative Steve Scalise is the House GOP's nominee for speaker. The final tally from the secret ballot vote was 113 for Scalise and 99 for Jim Jordan. Jordan had been previously endorsed for speaker by former President Donald Trump. Even though he has the House Republican nomination, Scalise still needs 217 votes to officially become speaker of the House. According to CNN, he is now meeting individually with GOP members to convince more than a dozen holdouts to back him for the final floor vote. In New York City, defense attorneys for former Marine accused of putting a fatal chokehold on a homeless man who was acting violently on a subway is asking the judge to dismiss the case. Back in May, Jordan Neely began screaming and threatening subway riders, after which Daniel Penny held the 30-year-old in a chokehold to subdue him. Neely died soon afterward, and a medical examiner ruled it homicide. In June, a grand jury indicted Penny on charges of manslaughter and criminally negligent homicide. He claims Neely was putting the subway patrons in danger, and his intent was to keep them safe. The death toll of Americans in Israel has now risen to 22, and that number is expected to climb higher, according to the State Department. For the fourth time since the attack on Saturday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke by phone with our president, Joe Biden. The issue is the fate of Israeli and American hostages being held by Hamas, who have become pawns in this war. Laura Geary has the latest, and we must warn you, the details and images you're about to see may be disturbing to some. 
My commitment to Israel's security and the safety of the Jewish people is unshakable. A commitment made stronger as escalating reports of atrocities against civilians in Israel emerge. We've never seen such savagery in the history of the state. And they're even worse than ISIS. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu sharing that comparison with President Joe Biden in a call Tuesday. In the hours since, new discoveries of Hamas's brutality have come to light. Murdering civilians, children, women, uh, to dragging a Holocaust survivor in a wheelchair across the border. Israeli officials say that in at least one village, infants and toddlers were found decapitated, claims that Hamas denies. These images and the depravity of Hamas has got to be addressed. They've got to be neutralized. The reports worsening the fears of those who have loved ones being held hostage by the militant group. This is a very crucial moment. We have no time to think about the dead. It is Hamas that needs to listen very, very carefully because if they want to come out in any way or form of this conflict alive, they need to release those people immediately. For now, Israel is amassing troops and preparing for a ground offensive in Gaza. The ramifications of this strategic attack against Israel is a game changer, and we need to change the rules of this game. I'm Laura Aguirre reporting. All right, outside, we've got some clouds and temperature changes headed our way. Look at our temperature trend for morning lows. 60s tomorrow morning, near 70 on Friday, and then by the weekend, the fall-like air settles back into place. That's what's going to be nice, is we'll have those mornings back down in the 50s by this upcoming weekend and even into next week. We have more changes to talk about, some fog developing, cooler temperatures today, a bit of a temperature roller coaster, and the solar eclipse forecast in just a bit. Thank you, Adam. And yes, the excitement is mounting for Saturday's annular solar eclipse, but so is the danger risk. Scientists and eye doctors cannot stress enough, do not look directly at the eclipse without eye protection and the right eye protection. Doctors say if you do, you could damage your eyesight, possibly permanently. And this is the case at any time as that eclipse develops for the hours leading to the so-called ring of fire and afterward, just around noontime on Saturday. The damage is called solar retinopathy, so rather solar retinopathy. It can be temporary blindness or a permanent condition. So there's a two lens system and think of it like a magnifying glass. Like when, you know, like when we're all little kids and we go out in the sun and use a magnifying glass to burn a hole in a piece of tissue paper or something like that. We have lenses inside our eye that's doing the same thing. The damage to the eye is immediate with a dark spot, or in the case of this eclipse, an arc darkening your vision. To avoid this, viewers must use a pair of ISO approved filtered lenses like you're seeing him wear right now. Polarized sunglasses are not going to work, so make sure they have that ISO seal. Take a look at your evening commute on this Wednesday. Taking a look downtown there at I-35 in Maine. Looks like everything's moving along smoothly, but a little slow. Still ahead on the news at 5, a fraction of the size of a regular home, tiny homes could cost you more in homeowner's insurance. Why that's the case for some and how to lower your premiums. That's next. I'm Myra Arthur here in the newsroom, and here's what we're working on for the news at 6 o'clock today. Confusion in the murder case of a five-year-old boy whose body was found in a Colorado ravine. Court transcripts here in San Antonio revealed the district attorney may have told a defense attorney he would reduce the charge. What we found out today at 6. Plus, a month and a half long battle for information from the Bear County Sheriff's Office. That's after a man died at the jail intake center. Tonight at 6.30, KSAT investigates, talks with the man's family, who claims the agency is hiding the full story and not complying with its own policies. And local leaders reacting to the war in Israel. Coming up, a Bear County Commissioner's personal connection to the country. That and more today on the News at 6. Thank you, Myra. Homeowners insurance is pricey enough, but if you think it's cheaper if you have a manufactured home or a one of those trendy little tiny homes, think again. Yeah, 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz looks at why that is and how you can lower those premiums. 
Lisa Gill lives in a Texas tiny home. My favorite thing about my tiny home is my bathtub. She also loves not having a mortgage, but one thing isn't so tiny. So what I pay for insurance every year is pretty steep, but I've taken a few steps to lower my bill. Tiny homes and manufactured homes are popular, but insurance costs can be double those of a traditional home. So why does it cost more to insure less house? The insurance industry points to greater susceptibility to wind, hail damage, tornadoes, fire, theft, and vandalism. But Gill, who writes for Consumer Reports, says there could be more to it. Some consumer groups say that insurance companies may be more likely to take advantage of financially vulnerable people, charging them more money for a few benefits. And there also may be some discrimination around the days when mobile home parks were predominantly located in poor and crime-ridden zip codes. Only a handful of companies insure manufactured homes. Less competition can also mean higher rates. When it's time to shop around for a policy, consider working with a local independent agent. Doing so can be a lot more efficient than shopping for yourself online. Also, be sure you have the highest possible credit score that can determine your premium. Ask about bundling your home and car insurance with the same company. Consider a high deductible that can shave hundreds off your premium. And say you're paying the premium in full all at once gets you a discount. After all, Gil would rather spend her money on... My garden and landscaping. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Tiny home on a mountain with no one around. That okay. Fantastic. Or on a lake. Somewhere. Somewhere. Somewhere I could go fishing. Neighbors miles away. All right. We're fantasizing here. <laughs> we need to win the lottery. <laughs> no. That ain't that. happening. <laughs> Lucky enough to get maybe some rain. Yeah, and the weather lottery is coming our way this weekend. Back to more fall-like and crisp conditions. Let's get right to our high temperature trend. We talked about those morning lows a bit ago, how they'll be back in the 50s by this weekend and even through most of next week. But our high temperatures well into the 80s tomorrow, 90 again on Friday, only to be reset back into the upper 70s on Saturday, the near 80 thereafter. Notice the average high is 84, so it looks like we have a stretch coming our way where, where we'll actually be a little below average, which is something to celebrate after the hottest summer on record. Even these clouds, you look at these stubborn clouds sticking around and they even got a little bit darker in spots this afternoon, dropping a little bit of drizzle on the north and northwest side of town. We're seeing some clearing out there and I anticipate some more clearing. However, I don't think you'll really notice it because underneath the clouds we'll have some fog and you'll notice that fog, especially after midnight and first thing in the morning for the morning commute. More dampness to start the day tomorrow. But it's just in the form of fog. Notice the visibility is under five miles for the morning commute. This is our computer model at 8 a.m. And it's even showing some visibilities below two miles. Once we get closer to 10 a.m., that fog is going to lift and disperse. And by the noon hour, we'll probably start to squeeze in some sunshine. One of the issues here is the mugginess. I know it's not hot outside, but you still feel mugginess and that humidity in the air. Dew points well into the 60s all across the board. That's going to be changing by this weekend. The mugginess will help to generate some of that fog tomorrow morning. Even again, Friday morning, we could have some fog with that humidity, but then the humidity swept away by the Friday cold front. And Saturday through next week, we're looking at a nice stretch of crisp, comfortable air with a lack of mugginess out there, which allows for the cooler mornings. Notice our time lapse, low gray clouds, but then we get some breaks here and there, and that's the view uh, looking south from I-10 and 410. 74 our high temperature today, that's 10 degrees below average, three hundredths of an inch of rain in the bucket at the airport. Panna Maria, th three tenths of an inch, shirts six hundredths of an inch from the rainfall. Bernie, 600 of an inch. Around Lavernia, two tenths of an inch. Some higher accumulations down in Frio County and farther south of San Antonio. Temperatures, though, by and large, still in the 70s. 77 in Castroville, Canyon Lake at 72. You can see where we have sun in West Texas. Temperatures in the 80s to near 90. Tomorrow, we start the day at 67 with that fog. Then by noon, starting to clear out 79, 87 and sunny by 4 p.m. We should get well into the 80s. If the clouds linger a bit longer, then obviously we'll trim off a few degrees. Notice the solar eclipse on Saturday. It peaks at 11.52 a.m. With that, the forecast is looking pretty good. I am anticipating some early morning clouds to linger, especially west of San Antonio, but even locally. However, they should clear out 
mostly and nicely for the peak of the eclipse. Perfect. Thank you, Adam. All right, the Spurs head back to work as they get ready for their next preseason game. And one thing that we keep talking with the Spurs about, Pop and the players, is Wimby's role on the team this year, whether mm -hmm. he's going to play down low, whether he's going to play outside. We're still trying – actually, the Spurs are still trying to figure that out. But one thing we do know, Wimby's defense will always be a force to reckon with. And the Houston Astros are looking to close out the Minnesota Twins here in a little over an hour coming up. We did. We sang him a big happy birthday. Happy birthday to Keldon Johnson, who turns 24 years old today in Big Board Sports. Here's Victor Wimbanyama and Manu Ginobili saying hello at Spurs practice today. You know, it's cool to see part of the Spurs past and part of their future on the court at the same time. Now, in the Spurs 122-121 preseason loss to OKC Monday night, Wimby had a team high 20 points, making 8 of 13 field goal attempts in 19 minutes of action. He had two steals and one block shot. Now, Coach Pop should have a lot of fun trying to figure out if Wimby is a post player or a perimeter player. He's got the skills to do both, right? And no matter where he plays, his defensive presence will always be felt. Yeah, I mean, defensively, uh, I don't even know what to say. I mean, the times where he's in shift or he's in our gaps and he's able to help us out and recover, I mean, there's nobody else in the league who can do some of the stuff that he can do. Um, when he's roaming the paint and he's blocking shots and doing something, like, at the end of the day, he's going to help us out so much. I don't think he realizes how much he's going to be able to help us out. Um, like I said, for Pop, that's for him to figure out if he's going to be on a wing post. I think he's going to do a little bit of both. Um, but at the end of the day, it got to be just whatever works best with the team, too. So we'll just figure that out, too. Spurs will continue preseason play Friday night at home with the Miami Heat at 630. Astros fans are hoping to do a lot of clapping tonight in Minneapolis where the Astros and Twins will play game four of that ALDS. The Astros lead that series two games to one and can close out the Twins this evening. Houston crushed Minnesota 9-1 yesterday in game three, scoring four runs in the first inning, and they never looked back. Jose Abreu hit two home runs and drove in five to lead the Astros' offensive attack. Tonight will mark the tenth time these two teams match up this season, and the Astros want to make sure it's the last time they do so. We want to win the game. Uh, you know, obviously we're facing a really good team, and you know we don't want to tie the series again. Nothing's given. Uh, they have a great team. They're not going to quit. So yeah, we just got to keep showing up, play our best game. They're a really good ball club, and they want to be in you know the postseason in the position that they are if, if they weren't good. So I mean, we just got to come out and you know same attitude, apply pressure, and you know have really good at bats. Game four is tonight at 6.07 from Target Field in Minneapolis. Astros lead this best of five series. Two games of the one, and the winner will face the Rangers in the ALCS. Should be a fun one to watch. Yep. Thanks, Larry. We'll be right back. All right, Saturday solar eclipse. We should have some pretty good viewing. Here's a question we get. Will it get dark outside? Actually, no, not during this eclipse. However, at its peak, starting around 11.52 a.m., it'll dim outside as if you're in the shade. So it's good. that's what it's going to look and feel like. You won't feel the intense sunlight on your skin. It's as if you're under the sun, but you're in the shade. Pretty cool feeling. Wow, can't wait. Thank you, Adam, and thank you for watching the News at Five. World News is next, we'll see you back here at six.